Welcome to one of three tech talks we're conducting here at WAF Virtual uh, today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce one of our uh, supporters, uh, VM Zinc, and uh, this session will discuss that marvelous material. Uh, some of you will know that at WAF last year, VM Zinc ran a competition where participants uh, in Amsterdam were invited to make something from pieces of zinc, um, showing not just design skills, but a certain craftability uh, to sculpt this uh, most malleable of metals. Um, to uh, really uh, introduce this session, and I'll come back at, at the end for some questions, I'd like to welcome the Operational Marketing Manager of VM Zinc, Mr. Jonathan Lowy. Jonathan, hi. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce Diana Dark, who, who's really the, the main event today. Um, I think she's going to be a fascinating talk. Uh, I have to thank uh, my mother who bought me Diana's book, Stealing from the Saracens, uh, as, a, as a birthday present. And it, it really is very, very interesting indeed. Um, Diana's an Arabist uh, who has worked in the Middle East for over 30 years. And indeed, she has a house in Damascus. Uh, she's written a number of books with uh, Stealing from the Saracens being uh, the latest, which among other, among other things highlights the interaction between culture, religion and architecture. So without further ado, over to you, Diana. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to be um, talking to an, an architectural audience, which is which is terrific because uh, I really would like this the, the knowledge which is in this book to, to reach as, as wide an audience as possible. So let me just start by explaining the, the, the title. So stealing from the Saracens. Now the word Saracens is being very deliberately chosen here because Christopher Wren, who's masterpiece there of St. Paul's on, on the right, um, is, is built, he tells us himself in his own words, using Saracen vaulting. And he explains why, um, he analyzes all the methods and said, I used it because it is the best. And so that's why um, the title of the, the cover of the book actually shows an um, inside uh, dome of St. Paul's. And um, you can, uh, just for those who might want to get the book, by the way, you go direct to the publishers, Hearst, and uh, put in the code Saracens25 to get a 25% discount, and again, get sent anywhere in the world, where, wherever you may happen to be. So um, it's uh, uh, a very um, interesting thing that perhaps not many people realize that so much of what we think of as Christian architecture actually originated in the east, in, in historic Syria. And when I say historic Syria, we must remember that up until World War I, uh, Syria, the province of Syria, the Roman province of Syria, then the Ottoman province of Syria, um, was from the Taurus Mountains right down to the Sinai. So basically the whole of the eastern Mediterranean. And this is where early Christianity developed. And so this is just a, a picture of the inside of St. Paul's to briefly show you the vaulting, which Christopher Wren said was Saracen. What he didn't know, of course, in the 17th century was that a lot of the other aspects of church architecture, so that the choir, the apse, um, the boulder chain, all these elements also developed in, in Syria. And so here we are now looking at Syria. And uh, what we're seeing here is the huge field of experimentation that um, where Roman pagan architecture made the transition into early Christian architecture. So uh, what we have here in, in Syria, in Northwest Syria, is an extraordinary collection, hundreds and hundreds of settlements known collectively as the dead cities. And in the dead cities, there are over 2000 churches, which very clearly then show that this, this transition into um, into the earliest form of Christian architecture, which was basically from the sort of um, fourth, fifth and sixth centuries is when we start to see things that we would recognize as, as a church. Um, before that, you know, houses were used essentially. So here on the left is one of the most important of those churches in the dead cities. It's called Kalblause. It was built in 460 
and it's the earliest of what we now think of as Romanesque or Norman, this uh, twin towers flanking a monumental arch. And this, uh, this extraordinary building, which is still standing um, and you know, has survived earthquakes astonishingly through, through everything that's happened, um, was, um, uh, as I said, built in 460 and it was on a pilgrimage route to the, the place on the right hand side there. The picture uh, shows St. Simeon's Basilica. St. Simeon was an incredibly famous um, early monk um, and the pilgrimage site to go and hear him speak from the top of his pillar. It was the equivalent of the Santiago de Compostela of his day. I mean, the influence is cannot be overstated. People would would um, would come from all over Europe um, to hear him preach. And this is just a detail I'm showing you now of the stonework in um, St. Simeon's Basilica. And just look at that incredible craftsmanship there. And this is to, to show you that Syria um, is, is limestone is the building material everywhere. And there's also some volcanic black basalt, which affected the designs as well. But this, this um, because it is the, the local building material, the, the, the skills of the stonemasons go back centuries and centuries. I mean, to, to, to the beginning of time, basically. And look at those acanthus leaves are swaying in the wind. This is Syria is the only place where this kind of thing happens. It, it's not the same as Rome. What happens, Rome in the east takes on a whole new, much more exuberant type of, um, of carving where the movement of nature um, and the focus of, on nature is very, very marked, completely different to, to what was happening in the Western Roman Empire. And this picture now I'm showing you, uh, just to remind you that sadly, um, this area is actually still at war. I mean, this is um, the war is not over. St. Simeon's Basilica is, is on the edges of Idlib province. It's there are bombs all the time. So that beautiful acanthus uh, capital that we looked at is, is has now been uh, scattered by Russian airstrikes, sadly, and um, back in 2016. But the ground plan of, of St. Simeon's Basilica was the very first um, octagon it, within a cross uh, over a, a centralized dome. And this is 50 years before Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. So this area in Syria, if you like, is the huge backstory of Hagia Sophia. And here we now have some pictures of the um, of St. Simeon himself as he appeared in, in, in Europe, because as I mentioned, pilgrims were coming back with souvenirs and, and with relics. And, and so the cult of St. Simeon grew up a lot in France. So there's a, two villages called St. Simeon named after him. Here's a stained glass window in one of the local churches. Icons on the right there um, were, were, were show, showing him on his pillar. There's one in, um, in Venice, uh, in St. Mark's uh, Basilica, showing him on his pillar as well. So that is, is the huge pre-Islamic inheritance that the Muslims took over when they came into Syria and made Damascus their capital. This is the Umayyad dynasty. Um, so, so we're talking right at the end of the 7th century. And the very first architectural statement building that the Umayyads made was the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. And you'll see how they blended the architecture. Basically, they took, they borrowed from what was there before. So they've used the octagon shape um, and they've been influenced by the, by the churches that are all over Syria. But they've done something different with it. They've synthesized it, basically, into something different because they put all the color on the outside and all the decoration on the outside, along with a huge inscription uh, admonishing Christians for believing in three gods in the Trinity. But also inside, there are extraordinary innovations, things that we have not seen before in, in Christian Byzantine architecture. At the bottom, there are the very first um, pointed arches that start to appear. And just below the dome at the top are the very first trefoil arches. And as we know, these are the very first elements of, uh, of Gothic that come into architecture in Europe centuries later. Also with the Umayyads, one of the other in innovations that they introduced is what many scholars have recognized as the earliest rose window. This is from a palace called Khidrat al mafja in um, the occupied West Bank near, near Jericho. And it's been reconstructed and it shows from, from the position where it was high up in the audience hall, um, it was designed to let in decorative light and 
fragments of stained glass have been found in, in, in the excavations. So this, if you like, is the sort of prototype that what leads then eight centuries later to the absolute um, pinnacle of stained glass windows in, in Chartres. So um, now, after the Omeyads, uh, all these styles carried into Spain because uh, when the Omeyad dynasty came to an end and the Abbasids came in, um, it was quite violent. And, but one Omeyad prince, against all the odds, managed to escape and made his way across North Africa into, into Andalusia. And he made Cordoba his capital. And this is the inside of the main vault in, in the Cordoba Mesquita, as it's, as it's still known today. Uh, and this astonishing piece of, of geometry is a ribbed vault. Um, and so this is 10th century now. This is one of the extensions uh, of, the, of the mosque. It was extended, first built in the 8th century and then extended in the 9th and 10th. And this, this astonishing piece of geometry was examined by academics in 2015 and they were flabbergasted. They had never seen anything like it. Uh, they said it's a geometrical masterpiece and, and um, it has never needed repair, um, any kind of structural repair in its entire thousand year existence. And this essentially is because of the, the quality of the, of the mason's work. At the back of the Cordoba Mesquita is, is this showcase of the mason's marks who built this building. And if you look at them, uh, most of the names are Muslim. Uh, and so a, a few are Christian, but the overwhelming majority of the people working on these buildings, building these vaults, were Muslims who, of course, had carried their skills from, from Syria. And uh, here's a detail of the mihrab inside um, the Cordoba Mesquita. So you can see the trefoil arches, which we first saw in the Dome of the Rock now, um, in a little arcade of them there, starting to look rather like um, Gothic architecture from, from the patterning. And um, so that, if you like, is Muslim Spain. What I'm, show, what I'm going to show you now is how the pointed arch found its way into Europe. Um, and again, this is well documented by the histories, the church histories that um, uh, monks and abbots themselves recorded. So on the left here, we have Amalfi, Amalfi Cathedral. And around the year 1000, the Amalfi merchants were trading with the Eastern Mediterranean. And one of the places they went to regularly was Cairo. And in Cairo, they saw the pointed arches of the Ibn Tulun Mosque. And they brought this back um, and incorporated it into their cathedral. They imported the workmen and some of the raw materials. And then a very powerful Benedictine abbot came from Monte Cristino and visited Amalfi to buy some goods that were being traded. And he uh, saw the pointed arches and thought, I like those. I want some of those in my monastery. So he also imported the, the labor and the raw materials and installed pointed arches in Monte Cassino. Then the abbot of Cluny, the absolute powerhouse of the Benedictines, visited Monte Cassino, saw the pointed arches there, and the result was this incredible building known as Cluny III, and incredibly, uh, where, where the pointed arch was used in a monumental form for the first time. And, and so from there, it spread to, to Paris and, and became then the cornerstone. Everybody wanted it, basically. Once, once it um, became so popular with, with the, the you know, it was a fashion, essentially. Once once the top Benedictine monastery had it, then, of course, every bishop wanted it in his own town. So the style absolutely took off and coincided, of course, with a great deal of wealth um, after the Crusades um, that, you know, and, and, and the Spanish Reconquista, a lot of money. So the combination of money, the raw materials and the beginnings of the technology then in a, enabled this huge rash of, of Gothic cathedrals to be built. Now, here's another gateway through which um, uh, these, these elements entered Europe. This is Sicily, the, the, in Palermo, the, the Capella Palatina, where you have uh, a synthesis, again, of Fatimid arches mixed with um, Byzantine um, mosaics and, and uh, Muslim um, mukarnas, as they're known, another type of vaulting. Then you have Venice, um, incredibly influential. Now, the Venetians loved Islamic architecture. They went crazy for the arches, 
arches everywhere, pointed OG arches. Um, you'll see that round circular telephone dial motif, as it's known in the central palace there, the Palazzo Dario. That is, is borrowed from a, um, a Mamluk palace in Cairo. And again, the Doge's palace on the right there, everything has been synthesized into um, this extraordinary um, new thing that they've, they've adopted all the Islamic architecture very, very openly, all the elements that they've seen in their trades uh, with, with the cities of the Eastern Mediterranean and have, have synthesized it into something new. And here on, on, on the left, we have Burgos Cathedral. And Burgos Cathedral is one of the buildings that uh, Christopher Wren tells us is built in the Saracen style. Because the way he describes the Saracen style is he, he says, you know, from this delicacy, the profusion, the extravagant fancy of its ornaments, he said, it could only be attributed to the Moors, or what is the same thing, to the Arabians or the Saracens, he says. So, so this is what um, this, this sort of very delicate stone um, stonework and tracery, all of these things can be traced back to, to the origins in uh, Umayyad Syria. Now on the right here, still in Spain, we have the Sagrada Familia, um, Antony Gaudi, the most astonishing use of all these elements. Now Gaudi um, was openly influenced by Islamic architecture. Um, he loved the, he, it, I mean, it represents, if you like, a complete fusion of, of nature, geometry, and religion. And of course, it's still ongoing. It's not finished yet. It's still, um, it's not due to be uh, completed until 2026, the centenary of, of Gaudi's death. But it is the most remarkable example of a sort of organic structure, this use of nature and this sort of almost fractal geometry where, where, um, God is thought to reside in the in the sort of transition zone, if you like, um, in in the sort of imperfections, and and this this all all of this sort of um, philosophy, if you like, is very tied up with um, the way Muslims think about the, the internal space as well. So uh, now, of course, the Gothic revival takes place and starts to sprout all over key buildings in the 19th century, so our Houses of Parliament, Big Ben, covered in trefoil arches, pointed arches, um, you know, and this is after all our seat of government, and it made its way across the Atlantic too, to, to America. Um, Gothic was incredibly popular in, in uh, universities, colleges and schools, more popular than anywhere else in the world, and here we have Yale campus, Yale University campus. On, on the left there is the Harkness Tower, and on the right, looking for all the world like a, a Gothic nave, is, is the library, astonishingly. So um, Gothic, really important. And, and then to, to end on, uh, the, the US uh, Capitol Dome in Washington, which if you like is the sort of iconic structure rec um, you know, representing American government, I mean, it's, it's the, their equivalent of our Houses of Parliament, if you like, also uses inside the, the technology, the Islamic technology um, invented, first of all, by the Seljuks, um, and which Wren himself uses um, inside the dome. So even though we're looking at what appears to be a straightforward classical uh, piece of architecture, underneath it's hiding um, something which is completely different from another from another um, part of the world. And, and that's really my point, that everything builds on everything else. I mean, the book is, is a kind of plea for multiculturalism um, because you have to take the best from everything. So like, like Wren did, I mean, he, 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 he acknowledged that the Saracen vaulting was the best. So that's what he wanted uh, to, to, to have, and, and he synthesized it into something new. And it's this whole thing of synthesizing. Wren himself was the arch synthesizer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. That was, that was fascinating. And I think we're gonna see that there's an awful lot of um, uh, connections uh, actually about what you've talked about and what I'm going to talk about in a, in a brief presentation uh, about zinc, um, which does go around the world and um, you'll see has a lot of connections. And then I think we're going to get an opportunity to do a bit of Q&A. So um, 
as I said, I'm, I'm going to talk about how, how Zinc connects with some of the past and also a little bit of the present. Uh, bend me, shape me any way you want me is something that uh, Paul Finch will recognize. It was uh, an American breed song in the 60s and refers to the flexibility of Zinc, not only in its malleability and workability, but also in the type of architecture it's used with. Uh, there are some theories that the Acropolis uh, had a, a zinc or a zinc alloy roof. The, there's no absolute, absolute proof of that, but zinc was found in the ruins of Pompeii. So it has been around for quite a long time. Uh, moving forward though, on, on, the bottom left uh, is actually a, uh, a village in, in Southern France called Conque. Uh, Diana mentioned pilgrimages, and this is one of the, the main routes to the on the Camino de Santiago in, in northern Spain. And this church was called Saint Foy, was, was bu originally built by monks fleeing the Moors from Spain in the 8th century. It happened to be uh, in a part of France where there's an awful lot of coal and minerals. And VM Zinc bought, uh, built a rolling mill in the middle of the 19th century which still exists and still produces zinc uh, that is then sent around the world, including uh, into uh, projects such as this one, which is, a, uh, it's not the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Uh, it's a slightly more modern um, uh, mosque uh, with many, many domes, many, many minarets, all clad in, in zinc, in, in this case, in pre-weathered zinc. Keeping in the, the dome uh, idea, not quite a dome, this is, this is a building in a place where we should have been, Lisbon, and hopefully we will be in June. Uh, it's uh, an arena built by SOM over 25 years ago. Um, and it, it does in some way address one of the, the concerns that Christopher Wren had, which was about how weight and structure can uh, 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 affect aesthetics. Uh, the advantage of, of zinc as compared with lead that we, we I mentioned at the Haga Sophia is that it's much lighter. So you can have a, a, a much a lighter structure, maybe a more elegant structure, as you can see on the, the, the left side, wooden structure then clad again with standing seam zinc roofing. Lots of domes exist in zinc, not only just zinc, but also combining with other materials. This is the Grand Palais in, in Paris, um, zinc, glass, steel. And on the right, you can see some of the ornaments, which again reflect some of the, the things that might have come from the East. They're, they're quite similar in some of the stonework that uh, uh, Diana highlighted in Syria. So there's, there's probably something that's been taken from that part of the world. Another thing that's been taken from that part of the world is, is the idea of, of craftsmanship. Um, craftsmen applied their trade, moving around, learning their trade uh, in, in, in the Middle East, but that tradition started in Europe as well. And the, the Compagnon de Devoir, uh, which started in the 13th century and still exists, is really a way of, of, um, of craftsmen uh, learning their trade uh, traveling around the country, learning techniques. And one of the trades is roofing and zinc roofing, and that still exists to this day. And the, the craft of, of a zinc roofer is something that is absolutely key. Keeping in with a, with a sort of tower and spire theme, uh, we've one of the first zinc projects of, of modern era, and when I say the modern era, I'm meaning 1809, is, uh, is a church in Liège in Belgium, which was, which as I said, built in 1809. But many, many spires and towers uh, are clad in zinc, and the, the photo in the middle is a fairly traditional spire in Switzerland, and on the right, something a little bit more contemporary, but both clad in, in zinc. And then, again, a church, uh, this this has a or to me it has a bit of a feel of Le Corbusier, which I think Diana mentions in her book uh, was possibly influenced uh, on his travels. He spent time in um, southeastern Europe in Istanbul uh, before the, the First World War. So this 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 church 
um, has a bit of that feel. But the zinc again is used in a in a very curved way, cladding surfaces which are quite um, curved in many directions. But zinc's not only used on curved buildings, also fairly angular buildings. And yet again, here is a, a connection to the past. This is Wadham College in Oxford, uh, where not only di did Diana study, but also Christopher Wren. And this is a building that was designed uh, a new halls of residence by Eliza Morrison's a couple of years ago, uh, again, clad in zinc standing seam roofing. It's difficult to talk about zinc and history of zinc without mentioning this man. Baron Haussmann, who redeveloped Paris in the middle of the um, 19th century uh, with the Grand Boulevards, which are still very, very visible today. In fact, central Paris has not changed that much since uh, 1860, 1870. Uh, you can see at the top left there's the Arc de Triomphe, then there's the Gare du Nord, the Gare de Lyon. Uh, the left is the Al, which have changed, but much of central Paris, the Grand Boulevards, um, have, have remained as they were, clad with, with zinc roofs. And even uh, there's, there's a building, this is actually uh, uh, the Basilique of Saint-Denis in the suburbs of Paris. And obviously that building has been around a very, very long time and has changed very little. But what has changed uh, in Paris is some of the, uh, the housing estates, um, uh, which are not the greatest large concrete towers, which have lost uh, the sense of community um, they're, they're, they're really sort of a lot of social problems. And over the last decade or two, authorities have started to try and address some of these problems. This is actually a building in the centre, which was um, built only about five years ago, only a mile from the, uh, the Basilica of Saint-Denis. Uh, and it's a much smaller scale development, maybe going back to more not only European traditions, but also Middle Eastern traditions of having, um, whether it be churches, mosques, uh, schools, um, shops nearby. And this is a mixed use building with, with residential and uh, some um, other types of uh, mixed use shops and so on. And it's actually clad in something called Azingar, which is engraved zinc. Uh, Zangar is Persian for zinc, which is yet another connection. Now, I'm just going to give a very quick run through uh, zinc projects around the world, just to give you a bit of flavor of what's been done over the last few years. This is uh, in Brooklyn um, by Shop Architects. So zinc has been used here to clad the outside of a building as a, using a rain screen. Um, in, the, uh, in Hong Kong, this is the Kennedy uh, Swimming Pool Complex by Terry Farrell. Again, going back to the curved shapes uh, that you saw, you saw before. And staying in the curve theme, this is a, a port building in Limassol in Cyprus. This building actually won the uh, Mies van der Rohe prize in 2017. And here is a, a building on the Danube in Austria, uh, an art gallery in Krems, again using the engraved zinc, the, the Azingar, uh, in, in quite a, a contemporary striking way in a fairly conservative uh, part of the world, uh, but that follows, it's quite a common theme in Austria, some quite striking architecture in fairly traditional areas. Um, and then we've got not quite mosaics, not quite stained glass, but it is possible to use, uh, to color zinc, uh, to give it a, a slight color and to, to use small panels that give this sort of texture and clad very interesting forms. Now, just to end on uh, a little bit like Diana did indeed, this is um, Charterhouse School uh, in Surrey, south, south of London, uh, which most of the buildings were neo-Gothic, so in the middle of the 19th century, uh, and design engine were commissioned to build a new science block, which had to fit in with the, uh, the architecture, but in a slightly more contemporary way. So again, trying to mix things, have a, a reference back to the neo-Gothic uh, architecture with the sort of the, 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 the vertical windows, and there are some steep roofs, as you can see on the chimneys on the right. 
So hopefully that's given you a very, very brief uh, run through uh, of what Zinc can do. Obviously, if you do need more information, because there's a lot more that can be di discussed concerning techniques and systems, uh, we'd be very happy to uh, speak to you. But I'm going to hand back to Paul now, because I'm sure there's going to be a, a, a question or two. Uh, so over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, two fascinating presentations, um, both in terms of geography and particularly uh, in history. Uh, and Diana, if I can kick off with a question to you uh, from uh, Stefan Schmid. Uh, is there influence um, of the Persians um, in your book or, or in your subject? Oh, yes, definitely, yes. I mean, um, <clears throat> you, can't, you can't escape the fact that there's, you know, we, we think in terms of all our modern borders these days, but, uh, you know, what is currently Iran and what is currently Syria, you know, all, all blended into each other, basically. Um, so, so yes, huge amounts of influence, obviously. So the masons I was talking about in, in, in Syria, I mean, the, the, the Romans, the Byzantines were constantly fighting the Persians, the, um, uh, the, the, the Sassanids, and, and as they were at that time. And, and so um, all these influences came in and then they've been identified. So um, scholars have, have looked at some of the detailed carving that we see um, on, on, in stone on some of the front buildings and have identified a particular mythical beast, which is, you know, from, from Persia, for example. So, so yes, all of these things, it's fascinating to see how pretty much all of the designs trace back to Iran and, and what was essentially ancient Mesopotamia. Where, where civilization began, you know, that's, that's, it's hardly surprising in a way. Thank you very much. Uh, and another one for you, Diana, this is from um, Christiane uh, Briones. And uh, she makes the point that historically, um, the, the, the sort of people that we would today describe as architects were master masons. I suppose this links actually to Jonathan's point about the 13th century orange origins of, of the, the craftspeople who make zinc roofs. Um, so uh, her question is, do we have any records of master masons that identify who they were and where they came from? Well, this is, this is a fascinating uh, subject and a fascinating question because so much work is now being done for the first time on these sorts of areas. So more and more is being discovered. So literally just, just a couple of days ago, I was reading a learned academic article about um, Sicily, about Palermo, um, that has found that Muslim mason were brought over um, to work on these buildings. And of course, you know, we're talking, Nor I mean, Sicily was under the Normans at that time. And of course, you know, the Normans then came and conquered England, <laughs> 1066 and all that, and brought in to, to England all, all our Gothic cathedrals. You know, they, they even imported the stones. So, so many of these um, early methods and, 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 and uh, the, the, the level of craftsmanship, because of their um, com their superior education and mastery of geometry. That's what set the Muslim masons apart. And, and some, some of them were brought over um, by crusaders as prisoners. Um, there again, these are recorded. Incidentally, the, my book is fully footnoted, so the sources of all this information are, are, are given. So, um, but yes, you no know, more and more is emerging. I mean, I'm trying. I'm on the hunt at the moment for um, somebody's told me about an Arabic writing which has been found during repair work at Durham Cathedral. Now, of course, Durham is always held out as the earliest ribbed vault. Well, I'm personally convinced, but I, I have to prove it somehow that, that this was as a result of Muslim masons um, and, and the Norman who who um, who the the, the, the bishop of, of Durham. Uh, William de St. Calais, his name was, um, was a Norman knight who had just been on a, um, who'd been on a campaign in Sicily and had brought back Muslim masons. So, I mean, you, you can't explain the sudden leap in, in, um, in the sudden advance, you know, in, in, uh, in, in stone craftsmanship where, where, where the knowledge of geometry was so vital. I mean, it can only be explained by things like there's people coming in who had that knowledge and who were then able to pass it pass it over to their to their Christian counterparts. 
there was a fascinating slide you showed of it, it looked rather like a data set but it was the it was the marks that the masons had left on i i assume yeah. individual um tablets um but no names was is there a reason for this was there a, a religious some sort of religious uh, objection to the identification of 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 individual humans with with religious buildings absolutely not no no and there are names i mean i mean um, among those masons they're not all just masons marks i mean a few of them are are sort of like abbreviated signatures but they're not they're not just marks i mean these these muslim masons were were well educated by and large i mean they um, they, they could, they could, um, they could actually, uh, you know, write their names, and and so their their names appear. You, you'll see, you'll see Muhammad, you'll see Abdurrahman, you know. No, I mean they want to be remembered. Of course, you know their masters weren't so keen on them being. <laughs> and of course, it's in the, um, it's in the, uh, it's in the, it tends to be in the repair work. Um, down in the foundations, or whatever, that this kind of stuff is then stumbled upon. I mean, I'm rather hopeful that in uh, Notre Dame, in all the work that's going to be done there, that something may be found in in the whole rebuilding process there that that may link us back in a very concrete way that that um, you know it, it gives us the proof that we're looking for that we, we kind of know is there. We just have to find it. Now I've got a question for you, Jonathan, from Tarek Mokhtar. Um, and he would like to know um, whether there were reasons other than uh, function, cost, utility, why people would um, use zinc as opposed to other materials. Uh, why to use zinc? Um, well, there, there's, the, the, I suppose that the, the key reason today why zinc is used is is aesthetics so it, it's it's the visual aesthetic that the material gives to the outside of the building um, but quite quickly when when a, a designer an architect a building owner has thought about aesthetics uh, you get issues of durability of maintenance of recyclability um, of performance, whether it be wind, rain, um, even, and today, obviously, fire's been discussed a lot more. So you, you, you start with the aesthetics, but then quite quickly, people want to know how it's going to perform from a durability and maintenance standpoint. But I, I would say the aesthetics is, is, the, is the key starter. But was that true? Was that true in the 13th century? Oh, uh, well, no, the th going back to the 13th century, the Compagnon de, de Devoir, uh, who, who started the roofing uh, side of it, they, they, they were not using zinc as far as we know. That the Zinc, uh, in, in modern times, I mean, there are the theories about the Acropolis and Pompeii, but zinc in modern times started in uh, the uh, beginning of the 19th century. And um, it, it was it was produced as a material actually by by a monk in in Belgium who didn't really know what to do with it, and one of the first uses was uh, to, to make a bathtub for Napoleon, uh, which was carried all the way to Moscow and all the way back again. Uh, and then uh, somebody thought, right, well, we can do other things other than make bathtubs, and this is where um, Saint Bartholomew's Church in Liège. Uh, used zinc for the first time and I think it was almost sort of experimental and we thought we've got this material what are we going to do with it bathtubs roofs our roofs work well um, uh, and then it, it went on from there uh, and and before Houseman it started being used in Paris in the in the early 19th century I think there was a desire for Paris not to look too much like an Italian city which is obviously often uh, often uses copper so uh, it, it was there and it was appropriate. Well, I love the story of the bathtub and I've been fascinated, Diana, by your wonderful kind of explanation of these cross-cultural influences. I remember the exhibition about Venice and Islam and the way that it showed that the deeper you go into history, the more complex it becomes. Um, and it was only the modernists who tried to simplify everything uh, actually really without success. Um, Jonathan and Diana, can I thank you both for uh, excellent contributions today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.